Welcome. I'm Dr. Vinay Prasad. I'm a hematologist oncologist, and I'm associate professor of medicine at the University of California, San Francisco. In my professional life, I see patients, I teach trainees, and I do research in healthcare policy. This is Plenary Session. Plenary Session is a podcast at the intersection of medicine, oncology, and health policy, and you're listening to season three. On this week's episode. This week on Plenary Session, I'm back with the Beat AML Master Trial. You won't want to miss this discussion. This is what you've been waiting for. Beat AML. Did they beat it? You'll learn on this week's episode. If you like this podcast and want more content, follow me on Twitter at vprasadmdmph. Check out the YouTube channel, Vinay Prasad MDMPH. Patreon backers will get access to the slides for lectures I give on Plenary Session. Want to hear from us? Email us your question at plenarysessionpodcast at gmail.com. All right, this week's episode is the new Nature Medicine paper, Precision Medicine Treatment in Acute Myeloid Leukemia Using Prospective Genomic Profiling, Feasibility, and Preliminary Efficacy of the BEAT AML Master Trial. First thing, you know, on this podcast, I'm always critical of who wrote the paper, and guess who wrote this paper? Actually, the authors wrote this paper, Amy Bird, Amy S. Rupert, and John C. Bird, the first, third, and last author, are credited with writing this paper. So hats off to them. You know, this is what we should see more often. When people put their name, particularly in the first or last position of a manuscript, they should probably write it. It's kind of the standard in all other fields of scholarship, and it's unusual. It's not the standard here. But hats off to them. They did write it. Now, of course, this is not an industry-sponsored study. This is funded by the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. That's not the industry. Now, where does the LLS get their money from, though? Hmm. I wonder where they get their money from. Do they get it from people donating a dollar here or there? Maybe a little bit. They got some of those fundraisers. Where else do they get it from? Let me just look on their little website. LLS, public disclosure. LLS response to Senator Charles Grassley's letters of inquiry regarding public disclosure of industry support. The LLS is committed to maintaining the highest standards of compliance and transparency. We have our annual report. We accept funding from corporate donors, including pharmaceutical, medical device, and insurance industries when it, when it identifies companies that will provide support for LLS programs. LLS will only accept industry funding that is free of influence as to the content, format, or delivery of its educational research and public policy and fundraising goals. And that's pretty interesting. Pretty interesting. I'm looking at their research funding. They have $186 million in research investments. That's, that's quite a lot of money. Dang. LLS. Total assets of LLS, 591,000. Ah, but that's in thousands, so $591 million. LLS in fiscal year 2020, LLS raised $486 million. Wow, it's amazing. So let's talk about this paper. So what exactly did they do in the BEAT AML study? Well, they took patients age 60 or older with putative or suspected AML. And they excluded a few. They excluded people with myeloid sarcoma. They excluded people with APL, promyelocytic leukemia. You're out. They excluded people with CNS symptomatic AML, so AML that had CNS involvement or direct involvement. They excluded people with leukostasis who required things like leukophoresis, and they excluded people in DIC. I think those are more or less reasonable. Certainly, you should exclude APL. Um, they then consent patients, they took blood and marrow, and they observed them for seven days. And in those seven days, the only treatment you are allowed to give while staying on the study is hydria. Okay, you know, they're going to argue that this paper shows that that's quote, quote unquote, safe. And they're going to cite another retrospective study that says that that's quote, unquote, safe to give someone hydria for seven days when they have acute leukemia. Um, I think neither of these studies will actually prove the claim that it's safe. They are incapable of addressing that fundamental claim of whether or not it's safe because they're not really counting all the people who didn't make it to the end. We'll talk about that. Um, if you want to go back and listen to a prior episode of this podcast, I talk about the prior retrospective study that they cite. I note a number of challenges with interpreting that study in that way. The trial was powered for an 80% assignment success rate. So they have to assign 80% of people, I think, when that week is out. And one of their arms of the assignment is a marker negative arm. So it's, if you didn't match in any of the other arms, you get put in that last arm. So one would think that getting 80% in a week when one of the arms is you didn't match them in any of the other arms 
would be quite tractable and feasible. Um, and that power calculation would give you 109 participants. And yet, 487 are consented to this study, which is far in excess of what they need for their power calculation. And it's unclear to me um, why it is so much larger. I guess I don't know why they enrolled another 300 people. It doesn't really talk about that. Okay. Um, what else do you need to know? Um, okay. So they collect the marrow and they run a bunch of studies and they see if they can assign you to treatment. And what are the treatment arms? Well, if you have core binding factor, of course you get the CD200 antibody samalizumab plus standard induction. If you have NPM1 and FLT3 ITD, you get... Of course, the sick inhibitor entosplentinib plus induction if you're fit, or the sick inhibitor monotherapy if you're unfit. All right, I guess that's interesting. If you have MLL rearrangement, you get the sick inhibitor. I believe that's monotherapy. If you have IDH2 positivity, you get enositinib. Okay, that makes sense. That's the IDH2 inhibitor. If you have IDH1 positivity, you get ivocitinib and aza. If you have TP53 positivity, you get, you know it, what is the TP53 drug of choice? Of course, it's decidabine plus the sick inhibitor of entosplentinib. Entosplentinib is coming up quite often. It's uh, NPM1 and FLT3 ITD. It's MLL. It's TP53. And it's TP53 with complex karyotype. So that's the next one where you get sick inhibitor and decidabine. Um, it looks like they added another arm along the way, which is if you're TP53 positive, you get a NET8 inhibitor, pevanetostat, and AZA. Okay. And if you are another arm of the studies, if you're FLT3 ITD positive or FLT3 TKD positive, you get giltritinib monotherapy or you get it giltritinib plus decidabine. Okay, if you're TET2, you get a CD33 antibody plus AZA. And if you're marker negative, you get a CD33 antibody plus AZA. Phew. And what are the rough percentages? Well, 2% are core binding factor, 11% are MPN1, 2% are MLL rearranged, 11% are IDH2 positive. 5% are IDH1 positive, 20% are TP53 positive, another 8% are TP53, are TP53 with complex karyotype. Um, okay, wow, fascinating. I guess I would say, I mean, if one is a purist and they ask, is uh, a sick inhibitor and decidabine quote-unquote precision therapy for TP53 mutation... Um, I guess I would argue maybe not really. I guess it's just a sick inhibitor and a drug that we use all the time that's a hypomethylating agent, and I'm not really sure how one would consider that to be um, a, precision, a precision pairing. All right, moving to the next part. They can send 487 patients, and they were able to sign 395 people to therapy. But why didn't they assign 92 people? Well, 71 of them, or 77%, had an alternative diagnosis, like I guess MDS. So I guess they had low counts and, and their marrow, um, the percentage uh, didn't quite meet AML. So th there's no beating MDS here. It's just beating AML. 7% um, had a confounding medical condition. I don't know what that is. 3% had the symptomatic CNS involvement. 3% compliance concerns. I'm not sure what that means. One person had leukostasis requiring urgent therapy. One person had DIC. Um, okay. Then, after they did that, um, of the 395 people, 224 were treated on one of their sub-studies, and then 171 were not treated on one of their sub-studies. Now, what happened to those people? Well, it turns out some of the people who were not treated on the sub-study didn't do that well. Um, about 6% of them had to be treated with standard of care before the BEAT AML laboratory studies could result. Um, it looks like about 7% of them didn't even make it to treatment because of death or hemorrhage. Um, five got alternate to treatments before beat AML could result, including a different clinical trial. 38 went on palliative care, and seven even died before beat AML could result. Um, the authors quote, a retrospective analysis demonstrates that a treatment delay for up to eight days does not influence survival. But that analysis is not really capable of looking at that question, and, and their analysis isn't capable of it either, which we'll talk more about. Um, okay. So as they're waiting for these seven days to elapse, um, a couple of things are happening. Um, doctors are pulling patients off the study to give them standard of care chemotherapy, probably seven plus three, maybe in some cases, hypomethylating agents. They're probably not doing that to the average person on the study. They're probably doing it to the person they're really worried about that they're not going to make it to seven days. Um, 
there already is a selection bias going into the study, which is if you really think somebody needs to be treated tomorrow, you're not even going to approach them for the BEAT AML substudy. And indeed, you know, 35% of people at Ohio State, 15% of people at OHSU, 60% of people at Sloan Kettering, and 20% of people um, were not even enrolled onto these this, this protocol, um, even though it's a kind of a protocol that you can enroll on from the moment you even suspect AML. They're not even enrolled on the protocol which may be that there are other protocols, but it also may be that the provider didn't feel that they were suited for this protocol. Then when you enroll on the protocol, you're only scored as being in the BEAT AML arm if you're able to be paired with the therapy and you get the therapy. But if along the way you don't make it to treatment or the doctor has to pull the trigger and give you standard of care 7 plus 3 or something else before they could result or the doctor decided to pull you to another investigational study or you were even sent to palliative care, you're off protocol. You're off the sub-study. It's a very unusual design. There is a Kaplan-Meier survival plot that the authors um, talk about, which we'll talk about, and it really shows that if you were pulled off the study, the 28 people who went to alternative investigational therapies, um, the overall survival was the highest of the of, of all these four arms. If you remained on the BEAT AML sub-study and got one of those drugs I described, your median overall survival was 12.8 months very comparable to the investigational therapy arm. If you received a standard of care therapy, including the people who the doctor didn't wait seven days and just started giving standard of care therapy because they were probably quite concerned, your survival is a median of 3.9 months. Um, and if you required palliative care right off the bat, your median survival is 0.6 months and that Kaplan-Meier curve is precipitous um, and concerning. Um, what does this tell us? I, I guess it doesn't tell you, I guess, in terms of causal inference, what can you infer from this? I think you can infer nothing that, in other words, if you if you create a series of gauntlets um, to enroll people on a study, the people who make it through those gauntlets, that time delay, without deteriorating while taking only hydrea, they're probably going to be destined to do better no matter what you give them, even if you give them these in experimental therapies, which may or may not be actually quote unquote precision, um, then people who you have to pull off the study or you pull the trigger on giving standard of care therapy, even though they've already committed to the beta AML path and they've enrolled on the study, um, probably because you're concerned about them, they're not going to do as well. So it's really kind of an apples and oranges comparison. Here's how the authors describe it. Quote, the BEAT AML trial provides evidence that this new approach to AML therapy is safe for the large majority of individuals and the treatment assignment based on the dominant clone can be applied to virtually all older patients with AML. I would say that that is technically inaccurate. The authors do not prove that. And here's how you might study that rigorously. If you took 1,000 people and 500 of them go on the BEAT AML therapy consent arm and you're delaying therapy and giving them hydrea and you know 400 of that 500 you're able to match to a treatment arm um, and then of course um, you know maybe only uh, 300 of that 400 you're able to actually treat on substudy because another 100 you've got to pull off and give standard of care or give something else versus the other 500 that you treat standard the standard arm, which is the way I always trained, which was that, you know, you ought not wait that long to treat leukemia. And so you aggressively in the first couple of days start treatment with either seven plus three. Maybe you give a couple of days. Maybe you decide if they want to be a hypomethylating track or not. These days, I guess Aza Ven would be an option if you're willing to um, pursue that as well. Um, you, you, that's your other arm. And then the real question to prove something is safe, you have to prove that there's not an early death rate. But of course, as I described to you, you know, 7% of people didn't make it to treatment. They died or had hemorrhage. 6% of people had to be treated with standard of care before AML, before beta AML could result. Um, 38 went on palliative care. So how many would go on palliative care in the counterfactual world where you're aggressively treating people on day two, on day three? You don't know. And so for you to make the claim that beat AML says it is safe to wait, you needed to have a group of people in whom you did not wait. You aggressively pursued treatment and you need to show that they do not have an early death signal, that your arm doesn't drop off earlier while you're waiting. You didn't show that. And at every opportunity, you moving people off your beat AML survival curve to the quote, not treated on substudy survival curve. But the people not treated on substudy includes people who couldn't wait seven days. And if they can't wait seven days, well, they're not the same types of people who can wait seven days. They probably have more aggressive AML, more fragile underlying biology or pathophysiology. So I guess I would say that the study fundamentally is incapable of showing that this path is safe. 
And that retrospective study that they cite is also incapable, as I described in the prior podcast, of showing that this is safe. In fact, we don't know this is safe. In fact, it could be far more lethal than actually the old-fashioned way of giving people standard of care therapy rather rapidly. Next, the authors write, quote, the trial demonstrates that for the majority of older adults with AML, a delay in therapy to perform detailed molecular profiling was safe. Exceptions to this were patients with rapid proliferative disease or symptoms of leukostasis that are excluded from the study. Again, I, I would disagree with that claim. There's a sizable fraction of people who are going on to palliative care, including seven people who die while on palliative care before the treatment is even assigned. There are people who are dying before the treatment is assigned, and there are people who the doctor has waited and tried to wait giving hydrea as best they could, but then finally decided to pull the trigger. And you do not know that those people's survival decrement offsets any gain that the beta male may or may not have. You don't know if there is a gain because there is no control arm. So I guess to say something is safe is always relative. Safe compared to what? And if the answer is safe compared to what we were doing, you don't know that. Fourth, Although not a primary analysis objective of our study, patients who elected to receive the therapy assigned based on molecular profiling algorithm had a lower early death rate and superior overall survival compared to patients electing to receive standard of care therapy. Well, you know, that's not really a fair comparison because some of those people who are getting standard of care therapy, the doctor feels like, boy, they really ought to get standard of care therapy. Um, some of the people who are getting standard of care therapy, the doctor may be dissatisfied with the pairing. Um, they may they may feel like uh, a single agent IDH inhibitor. M you know, we don't know if that's as good as uh, seven plus three in an IDH two 61 year old who's really fit. They might be getting it for that reason, or they might be dissatisfied with the pairing or one of the options. Um, we don't know why the doctors are and the patients are deciding to go to standard of care therapy, um, but it's certainly not a flip of a coin. And so that kind of comparison, I think, is inappropriate and, and really doesn't prove anything. The authors write, quote, overall survival was significantly longer in the beat AML group, median 12.8 months, compared to the standard of care therapy group, 3.9 months, or palliative care, 0.6 months, but not significantly different from the investigational therapy group. I guess that to me tells me that the selection biases in the BEAT AML cohort and the other investigational therapy group, i.e. Um, people who can tolerate treatment delays, who have um, more indolent AML, who have stronger physiologic reserve, who can take hydria for a few days without um, having rip-roaring leukemic crisis, um, that they are destined to do better. But it doesn't tell me anything about whether or not I ought to be assigning therapy in this manner. So, you know, what does the BEAT AML study show? I think it does show the primary endpoint of the study that, you know, in a week you can pair more than 80% of people with an arm, given that one of the arms is that you didn't pair in the other arms. Um, so that's kind of, I think, a low bar for a 500-person multi-million dollar study. Um, it does show that. But does it show you're better off by doing this? Does it even show that this is safe? I don't think it's capable of showing that it's safe. Um in fact, by delaying or trying to delay, you may be compromising the outcomes of many, many people. You just don't see it because there's no control group to compare them against. The other thing I would say, um, I was curious as this trial was running, um, you know, what is the current standard of care in the IDH1 and IDH2 camp? And my understanding is, in fact, that while this study is running, we have the Agile study, which is AZA plus or minus Ivocidinib, a phase three randomized study. We have studies by Courtney DiNardo where she's doing a small phase two study of enocidinib plus AZA versus AZA alone in IDH2 mutations. And it's an ongoing phase two study. It's DiNardo uh, et al. in blood uh, 2019. So what's my point here is I guess I'm a little um, puzzled that, you know, some of these arms are redundant with ongoing efforts. So if somebody is doing a randomized phase two for the IDH2 mutation subtype, if somebody's doing a randomized phase three for the IDH1, what is the value of doing a umbrella protocol where two of those arms are going to be delivering those therapies, the investigational therapy, without a control arm? If anything, if you match in one of those buckets, they should refer you to DiNardo's study or refer you to the Agile trial. You see my point? My point is that every patient you're treating in a non-randomized fashion, whilst randomized trials are running, is um, a, 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 a delay in the randomized results. And if anything, the faster the randomized trials results, the the the, the better it'll be for everybody with that condition. Um, you know, so so that's one of my puzzles here. Um, the next puzzle is, you know, if you really did have marker negative AML and you're 61 years old and you're really fit, do you want 
BI836858, a CD33 antibody plus AZA? Or do you want seven plus three? Do you want full induction? And my guess is that maybe some of the people in whom the doctors and patients are deciding on getting standard of care are that they want the full induction because I don't know for sure because it is not randomized, of course, but my suspicion would be that a lot of people's pretest probability is that a hypomethylating agent plus a CD33 antibody does not induction make and is probably inferior to induction. So that's the other question. So overall, I guess I would say um, my main questions of this study is uh, a couple fold. One, you know, what was the question that they sought to answer? The question they sought to answer was, can you pair people in a timely fashion? Um, I think to some degree one can criticize that question because one of the ways in which you pair them is pairing them to an arm where they don't pair with anything because they didn't find anything to pair them against. So if that's one of the arms, um, you know, it's it's uh, almost certain you can try searching for seven days and if you don't find anything in seven days, just put them on the last arm, right? I mean, it's a it's whatever time period you want. You can get 100% of people paired. You have one day, okay, try your best. Whatever you can do in one day and then they go to the other arm if they you don't pair with anything. Um, that, so that to me doesn't... Um, it's not a very um, interesting primary endpoint, and that only justifies you know 109 people. So I don't understand why we got 400 more in this study. The next question is: um, they argue that this trial establishes that it is safe to delay treatment, and I would say this is a huge open question in AML, and we have to um, seriously address this in the future. Um, we do not know. We absolutely do not know if all these delays are compromising survival in our patients. Just because you give somebody hydria and their counts don't explode for a few days, you may feel like that was a safe maneuver, but unless you randomize them to the alternative where you are inducing them, as we used to do not that long ago when I trained, um, you don't know if there is some decrement you just don't see. Um, that decrement may even be in long-term survival and cure rates. You don't know. Um, it is interesting because obviously there is a strong unspoken bias among leukemia doctors that waiting is bad. And these two retrospective papers aim to break us of that bias so that we can do these types of studies in the future. Um, however, neither of, of neither are of the methodological rigor one would need to quell one's suspicions and fears. And so I'm, I'm not sure that that's the case. I think you do need some randomization to prove that it is safe as to effective, I think, um, to compare people whom the doctor felt they couldn't wait to treat to people whom the doctor could wait to treat um, is just not a apt comparison at all. Um, this is a very common tactic in, in sort of these precision oncology studies we repeatedly see from pancreas to AML um, to other genomic sequencing efforts. When you compare um, fundamentally different people with different mutations and different biology and different um, tempo to their disease, um, you can't conclude that the differences are due to what you're doing. It might be due to some underlying differences in the groups of people. All right. Well, those are the thoughts on beta AML. I mean, I get credit for the investigators um, for uh, obviously a large effort. Um, it's well published. Um, I'm sure it cost a lot of money. Um, they wrote the manuscript themselves. Um, I think their their heart is in the right place. I mean, I do think they want to think make things better for people with AML. I think that. Um, that that if we re that I think that future studies need to approach this from the point of view of a skeptic. You know, science is healthy skepticism, and if you enroll and if you run a study where you believe it's safe to wait seven days, um, and then you know you don't really test that hypothesis, don't be surprised if you conclude you, it's safe to wait seven days. But if you really want to test the hypothesis, we're safe to wait for seven days. Take a hundred people, fifty people, you treat the old-fashioned way, where you just give them treatment tomorrow, and fifty people, you do whatever the beta AML protocol is, and show me that there is no survival decrement. And if I were a betting person, I would bet there will be some survival decrement from from these kinds of strategies because um, these delays are serious things in 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 leukemia. And then the other challenge, of course, is that people who can tolerate the delays are definitely um, going to do better than people who could not tolerate or the doctor decided not to tolerate those delays. That, I think, is doesn't tell me that much. Um, all right. And oh, and then the last point, of course, is the duplicative nature of some of the buckets. If you have an ongoing basket study with an IDH2 bucket and you're treating people in an uncontrolled fashion whilst someone else is doing a randomized study for that same bucket, um, I, I, I really struggle from the company's point of view of why they're um, participating in both studies. 
I mean, if you are Agios and you've got your drug, why are you giving it to both studies? Because one study is is taking patients from your other your agile study, um, and so. Um, uh, that's the company's point of view. And just from the patient point of view, the faster you do the randomized study in that subgroup, the better. Um, I understand that they're asking different questions, but I guess I don't see why the IDH2 and IDH1 here just couldn't refer you to the DiNardo and the Agile study. That could be the bucket instead of just treating you off that study and on a different study that doesn't have a randomization. Okay, well, that's it. Me, beat AML. Um, I think it's interesting. It's... it's, it's um, it, it, it definitely reveals to me, I think, the difference between, um, you know, where the field is emotionally um, and where I believe they ought to be emotionally. And I think that chasm is, is the largest in precision oncology. And people who are interested in this type of thinking, it's not too late. Pick up a copy of Malignant. I mean, chapter, I believe it's chapter eight. God, it's been a long time since I looked at that book. I believe it's chapter eight where I take you through my thinking on precision oncology. Um, but I think that this type of critical approach is is necessary if we're going to really do what's best for, for AML patients. So on that positive note, we'll be back for a future plenary session. You've been listening to season three of Plenary Session. Plenary Session is produced by Kiana Klossner. Music by Ian Straley and Audrey Tran. The views expressed on Plenary Session are those of whoever said it and no one else. Plenary Session is not medical advice. Follow us on Twitter at plenary underscore session. Until next time.